I'm going to just, I'm just going to ask you uh, to give me a minute. Because it was after midnight, many years ago, when I was driving on a dark Alabama highway, I had been at home in prison. And I had been there because a client of mine, who I'd represented for many years, had been pulled away from me. The shave, the hair shaved off his body. And he was put in the electric chair and executed. I left the prison and I just didn't know whether I could go on. I'm not gonna lie. I remember driving down the interstate and this is why God is so good. And I had my tape recorder on. And I was playing Yolanda Adams. And I was doing all right until she started singing in the midst of it all. And then I had to pull over and just think about the fact that in the midst of this ugliness and barbarity, in the midst of this pain and suffering, God could still keep me. And because he kept me, I was able to keep on driving. So I can't tell you what I'm feeling right now, remembering that night on a highway many years ago and sitting here on this stage, in this place, listening to Yolanda Adams sing that song again. I'm just feeling something, I can't help it. It's gonna take me a while, but I'm just grateful and honored to have this opportunity to speak with you. I'm so indebted and committed and, uh, and, and, and truly in love with my great friend, uh, Dr. Manise King. She's doing a miraculous job leading the King Center. Whenever she calls, I just wanna say yes, and I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm delighted to be on this stage with so many talented, gifted people. This has been an amazing service with so much music, so much power, so much testimony. And I know the hour is late, but I just wanna say a few things. We're living in challenging times. We've survived this pandemic that has caused so much death and destruction. We're living at a time when there's economic inequality and and much despair, inflation is causing many to be hungry, to be struggling, to suffer. We're living at a time of war and rumors of war. The Bible talks about the fear and the anger that comes in a moment just like this. We're seeing so much violence in our society today, mass shootings, people going into churches and synagogues and supermarkets and killing people. And we're trying to make sense of these things because even when that has happened, you've got some people saying we need more guns, not less guns. It's troubling because when I look around, I just see so much fear and so much anger. Social media is a powerful tool that's allowed us to do incredible things, but it's also done something very corruptive to our society. I hear people celebrating meanness. It's made us less kind, less forgiving, less loving, and I worry about what that means for us. We're living at a time where these challenges can seem like it's impossible to see a way forward. There's political division and dysfunction. I, I'm hearing things I never thought I'd hear again in my life, and yet here we are. People preaching things that are rooted in hate and bigotry and violence. And so I'm wondering what Dr. King wants us to do in this moment. And I'm thinking about it. As has been said, my career has been as a criminal lawyer. I've been a, a criminal defense attorney representing the condemned. I've spent most of my time on death row in jails and prisons. I've seen what's happened in this country with the rise of fear and anger. We've gone from a prison population of 300,000 in 1972 to a prison population today of 2.2 million. We are the nation with the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We've become the most carceral, punitive society on the planet. And it bothers me because we haven't made the kind of reaction, we haven't said the kind of things that I think we need to say. We've got legislators all over this country debating policies, making up rules, making up laws, and they're talking as if they can put crimes in jails and prison. 
And they get angry about crime. We all get angry about crime. None of us wants to see the kind of violence that we see. But these politicians are talking as if they can put these crimes in jails and prisons. So they say, oh, I want to put that in pr crime in prison for 50 years, 100 years, life without parole, death penalty. And we created this extreme sentencing regime because we're talking as if we can put crimes in prison. But what I can tell you from my work is that we don't have the power to put a crime in prison. We can only put a person in prison. And what I want you to know is that people are not crimes. They can commit crimes, but they're not crimes. And what that means is that we've got to think differently about how we respond to the mental health crises in our communities. We've got to think differently to how we respond to trauma. You see, I've been taught through my faith that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And what that means is that when someone tells a lie, they're not just a liar. What that means is when someone takes something, they're not just a thief. It means even when someone kills something, they're not just a killer. And justice requires that we under, understand the other things they are. And so we need a revolution in our thinking about how we deal with this epidemic of incarceration and punishment. I'm coming here because I reflected on Dr. King and Ms. Coretta King's journey to Montgomery. When they went to uh, Montgomery in 1954, there was a struggle, not the boycott struggle, not the bus struggle that Dr. King immediately got involved with. There was a 16-year-old boy named Jeremiah Reeves. And Jeremiah Reeves had been falsely accused of sexually assaulting a white woman. Everybody in the black community knew that this woman was somebody he was having a relationship with. But when they were discovered, he was accused of sexual assault. And they took this 16-year-old child to the Kilby prison where the electric chair is, and they strapped him into the chair, and they threatened to electrocute, you, electrocute him if he did not admit, if he did not confess to these crimes. And think about it. They were throwing the switch, but nothing happened. They were terrifying and torturing this young child, and finally he confessed. And after he confessed, they, they pulled him out of the chair, they took him to trial, and he was convicted and sentenced to death. All white jury sentenced him to death in less than 30 minutes, and the community was outraged. And they didn't have a way out, and the black people were talking about the outrage. Claudette Colvin, who didn't give up her seat on a bus almost a year before Rosa Parks, protested in part because Jeremiah Reeves was her classmate. Rosa Parks got involved in the case of Jeremiah Reeves. She made sure that his poems were being published in the Birmingham world, and Dr. King became one of his advocates. They got Thurgood Marshall involved, and they overturned the conviction, but it came back, and he was convicted and sentenced to death again. So in 1958, they took Jeremiah Reeves back to that electric chair, and this time it wasn't pretend. They executed him. It broke the hearts of black people in Montgomery. The community was grieving and mourning. And Dr. King decided to have a rally at the state capitol. And he called everybody to the capitol. And in front of that whole crowd, Dr. King on Easter Sunday told the crowd that they have crucified the truth. They've buried justice. But then he said, but one day, believers, truth and justice will rise again. And he told people, we have to believe in this power we have to resurrect truth and justice. You see, I think truth is being crucified today. I think we've buried justice. And what I want to talk about is how we become a community that resurrects truth and justice. It's not an easy thing. It's a hard thing. Dr. King's last speech was at the Washington Cathedral several days before he was assassinated. And what he did at the cathedral was give a history lesson because Dr. King understood is that we cannot understand the truth of who we are in this country if we don't reckon with our history, if we're not more honest about our history. And the truth is we're not free in America. We're burdened by a history of racial injustice that's created these contaminants in the air. They're like pollutants everywhere you go. And it's not just in the South, it's in the North, it's in the East, it's in the Northwest. Wherever you live in this country, you live in a space where these contaminants have created an unhealthy environment. And some have argued that at some point they'll dissipate, but I don't believe that I think we're going to have to change the environment. And what Dr. King said is that we're going to have to talk about these things that we haven't talked about before. My dear brothers already explained to you that we are a post-genocide society and we haven't talked about it. We, we, we saw a genocide when, when Europeans came to this continent because millions of indigenous people were killed through famine and war and disease. We kept their words and we kept their lands, but we made them leave the space. 
And we haven't talked about the suffering and the pain that that genocide created. And instead, while we were creating a constitution that talked about equality and justice for all, we were creating a narrative of racial difference. And this narrative of racial difference has been planted in America. And it's like an infection and it keeps growing. And that's why we have to change this narrative. We cannot resurrect truth and resurrection without talking about this narrative of racial injustice that we have inherited. You see, that narrative was what allowed those framers of the Constitution to abuse indigenous people. They said, no, those native people, they're different. They're savages. And they use words and language like that to exclude them from the promise of our Constitution. And it was that same narrative of racial difference that was used to justify enslavement. And I don't think the great evil of American slavery was the involuntary servitude and the forced labor. I think the real evil of American slavery was the narrative that was created to justify enslavement. You see, enslavers didn't want to feel immoral or unjust or unchristian, so they had to create a narrative that allowed them to feel moral and decent and Christian while they enslaved other people, while they saw black mothers being separated from their children. So they came up with this false narrative where they actually created a narrative where they said that black people are not as good as white people. Black people are less capable. Black people are less worthy, less deserving, less evolved. And that narrative of racial difference was used to create an ideology of white supremacy. And we need to understand that because we never really talked about that narrative of racial difference, that ideology of racial, uh, of white supremacy, the racial hierarchy that we were, cre that created in this country. And even many abolitionists believed in the end of slavery, but they didn't believe in racial equality. And so we fought a civil war and yes, the North won the civil war, but the South won the narrative war because even after the civil war, that ideology of white supremacy, it continued. And we had a constitution that guaranteed equal protection and the right to vote, but we didn't extend that to black people. And for a century, black people were pulled out of their homes, they were beaten, they were drowned, they were tortured, they were lynched on courthouse lawns all throughout this country. And we didn't really talk about the pain and the suffering and the agony and the trauma that a century of racial violence and terrorism created. We haven't really acknowledged what we did to so many people in this country. You know, the demographic geography of America is shaped by racial terrorism. You see the black people in Chicago and the black people in Cleveland, and the black people in Detroit and Los Angeles and Oakland and Boston and Minneapolis and in, in, in Harlem did not go to these communities as immigrants looking for new economic opportunities. They went to these communities as refugees and exiles from terror in the American South. There's a line from Mississippi to Chicago, a line from Alabama to Cleveland, a line from Louisiana to Detroit. And these lines were created by six million people who were fleeing for their lives. And when they got to the north, they weren't welcomed. They weren't treated with respect. They didn't face the same vet, uh, a risk of mob violence, but they were put in ghettos. And you can see the footprint of this trauma all across the country today. And now you have politicians blaming people in these communities for what they have failed to do without acknowledging the context we haven't told the truth about what we did to black people in America. And while that was happening, we created a legal architecture of racial segregation. And many people want us to just forget like that didn't really happen, like there weren't consequences for a decade of humiliating every black person, telling black people they can't be here and they can't be there. They don't realize that those signs that said white and colored, they weren't directions, they were assaults, they created injuries, they created pain and we haven't treated those injuries. And that's why Dr. King's life was so miraculous, so powerful. He created a movement that allowed us to break down some of those legal structures, but that mindset, that narrative of racial difference, it continued even after the civil rights era. This presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people, it continued. We didn't talk about the narrative. And here we are in 2023, and we're still burdened by this narrative of, 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 of dangerousness and guilt. That's why so many people were on the streets in 2020 after another incident of police violence. It's not right, it's not fair that you can be a talented doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a Morehouse or a Spelman student, you can be a pastor, you can be kind, you can be loving, but if you're black or brown, you will go places in this country where you're gonna have to navigate a presumption of dangerousness and guilt. <laughs> and, and what I'm saying to you is that when you begin to to kind of acculturate and accept these narratives of presumptions of dangerousness and guilt, it starts to do something unhealthy. 
Black parents shouldn't have to tell their children that they can't be free like their white friends when they go out in public places because they're going to be confronting a narrative of presumption of dangerousness and guilt. Uh, I've argued all these cases before the United States Supreme Court, and I was going around the country representing young people. And I remember being in a courtroom in the Midwest. I had my suit and tie on. I got there early. I was sitting at defense counsel's table to do this hearing. And I remember sitting there when the, when the hearing began, and the judge walked in, and he saw me sitting there. And he got angry. He said, hey, 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 you get back out there in the hallway. I don't want any defendants sitting in my courtroom without their lawyer. And then I had to stand up and apologize. I said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian Stevenson. I am the lawyer. And the judge started laughing and the prosecutor started laughing. And I made myself laugh because I didn't want to disadvantage my client, who was more vulnerable than I was. The client came in. We did the hearing. But I remember afterwards sitting in my car thinking, here I am, this middle-aged black man in my best suit with all of these degrees and all of these honors. I argued the case at the Supreme Court that we were talking about, and yet I'm sitting here realizing I still have to laugh at my own humiliation to do justice for my clients. And what I'm telling you is that we cannot go on like this. We cannot. We cannot go on like this. We're going to have to commit to a new era of truth and justice. You see, I believe that what Dr. King would want us to do right now in 2023 is to recognize that we are going to have to be the bearers of a new banner. And the banner's got to say truth and justice. We're going to have to talk about these things we haven't talked about. You see, in South Africa, if you go to the Apartheid Museum, they tell the honest truth about the pains of apartheid. There was a process where the victims of apartheid could give voice to their pain and anguish. If you go to Berlin, Germany, it's interesting to me when I go to Berlin, it's a landscape that is kind of co co polluted, with, covered with icons that celebrate and talk about the horrors of the Holocaust. You can't go 200 meters in Berlin without seeing a marker or, or a stone that's been placed next to the home of a Jewish family that was abducted during the Holocaust. Uh, you, you, people are encouraged to go to the memorial that celebrate, talks about the lives lost of all of those who died in the Holocaust. The cab drivers and the hotel operators encourage everyone to go to the Holocaust memorial. There's a commitment. Every German student in Germany has to go to a place that talks honestly about the Holocaust. Nobody in Germany is saying, oh, we can't teach our children about things that make them uncomfortable or might cause them to feel shame. They've, they've accomplished something that we have not accomplished because they've been willing to commit to truth and justice. When I go to Germany, I'm fascinated because there are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany. There are no markers and memorials to the perpetrators of the Holocaust in Berlin. And yet I come back to Georgia and Alabama and I sit around me, all of these icons and monuments and monuments celebrating those who should not be celebrated. And when we start talking about taking them down, we're considered radical and unfair. The truth and justice cannot allow us to be quiet about these things. You see, I think truth and justice means that we've got to be willing to do the things that have not yet been done to create a new era, a new change. And I believe that uh, Bernice talked about our museum and our memorial. I want to invite everybody to come and spend time in our sites because we see them as truth-telling spaces. We believe there's something important that has to happen when we commit to truth-telling. But it's not enough to hear the words, I think we're going to have to take actions. You see, I'm persuaded that if we're really serious about truth and justice, there are these things we've got to do. One of the things we've got to do is we've got to stay proximate. We've got to stay connected to the poor and the oppressed, the marginalized and the excluded. Because it's only proximity to those who are suffering that teaches us what truth really requires. I'm persuaded of that. I'm also persuaded that if we're going to be committed to truth and justice, we've got to stay hopeful. We've got to believe things we have not seen. We've got to be ready to move things that have not yet been moved. I'm going to tell you a story that embarrasses me a little bit. But I went to Harvard Law School. And when I got to Harvard Law School in 1981, I'd never met a lawyer, never met one. And the first day they pulled students together and they put them in small groups and they took them out to make them feel comfortable. And the small group leader would ask everybody why you're in law school and how did you get here? And I was in this group of 10 other students and each and every one of those students was the son or the daughter or the nephew or the niece of an attorney. And they talked about their family history of lawyers and all of the ways in which they'd thought about the law. 
And I was sitting there feeling diminished because I'd never met a lawyer. And I did something I shouldn't have done. I did something hopeless. I didn't tell people that I'd never met a lawyer. I just made a joke. I didn't talk about it honestly. And I kept thinking about it and worrying about it. And a couple of weeks later, I realized that that was hopeless and I couldn't do that. So I tried to find those students in that group and I wanted to explain to them that I didn't know a lawyer until I got here, that I started my education in a racially segregated school. I grew up in a community where black children couldn't go to the public schools. I grew up in a community where there were no high schools for black kids when my dad was a teenager. In the community where I lived, none of the black adults had high school degrees, but then these lawyers came in and enforced the Supreme Court's decision under Brown versus Board of Education. Because those lawyers got proximate to poor kids like me, I wanted to go to high school and I went to college, and that's why I'm at Harvard Law School. It's not because I know a whole lot about the lawyers. And then I realized that to be hopeful meant that I had to create a new narrative of who I am. And I didn't want to present to people that I was somebody fancy or protected or privileged. I want everybody. And that's what I started doing now. I can't go anywhere without telling people who I am. And what I want you to know is that I'm the great grandson of two people who were enslaved in Caroline County, Virginia. And what I want you to know about my enslaved great grandfather is that even when he was 15, he decided he would learn to read because he believed that one day he'd be free. And it wasn't a rational thought in Virginia in 1850 to believe that freedom was coming, but he believed that he'd be free one day. So he learned to read and there were anti-literacy laws that could have meant that he could be arrested or sold or killed, but he took the risk to read because he thought that was essential. And when freedom came, my great grandfather, he started a church and he used the church to teach others. And my grandmother talked about how every week people who were enslaved would come to their home. Formerly enslaved people would come. And my great grandfather would stand on the porch and he'd read the newspaper so people would know what's going on. And my grandmother loved the power that he had just by reading. And she told me she would sit next to him and wrap her arm around his leg because she wanted to get the power he had to read. And she thought if she held on to him, it would pass into her body. And he finally had to explain, Victoria, no, it doesn't work like that. I'm going to teach you to read. And my grandmother was a domestic. She worked and cleaned houses her entire life. She lived into her 90s, but she was a reader. She had 10 children, and she made sure that all of her children could read. And when I'd go see my grandmother, sometimes she'd be standing outside on the porch with a pile of books in her hand. And sometimes she wouldn't let you in the house until you read something from one of the books that she gave you. She knew the power of language and education. She saw hope in what education could do. And I'm telling you about it because I want you to know who I am. My mom was the youngest of her 10 children. As I said, we grew up in a poor community. When you looked outside our door, you didn't see much opportunity. You didn't see much promise. Most of the adults worked in the poultry plants. They got on the buses to the chicken factories. But my mother, even though she was poor, went into debt to buy us the World Book Encyclopedia. And we had these books in our house. And they were the precious resource in that house. And I didn't understand it at the time, but my mother would tell us to go look in these books and see a bigger world. I didn't always understand it because, you know, Christmas would come around and I'd go outside and my friends would say, well, I got a basketball for Christmas. I got a bicycle for Christmas. I, I, I got this uh, toy for Christmas. And I'd have to say, well, I got volume G of the World Book Encyclopedia. But when I think about it now, what I think about is this generation of people who had a hope that one day in a place like this, a group of motivated, educated, inspired people would come together. They'd start talking about how we move forward to advance truth and justice. I really believe this. I believe that we are called in this moment to do something that has yet to be done. And we've got to get proximate. We've got to stay hopeful. But the third thing I have to tell you is that we have got to be willing to do uncomfortable things. You cannot honor Dr. King if you're unwilling to do something uncomfortable. The path to justice is going to mean we have to do inconvenient things, hard things, challenging things. My work has been glorious in many ways, but it can also, I can also tell you it's been challenging. I, I argued a case at the Supreme Court that banned mandatory life sentences with children. We've got 13 states in America with no minimum age for trying children as adults. We have hundreds of kids that we've put in adult jails and prisons. There were thousands who had been sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, some as young as 13 years of age. And so when we won this case, I was just so enthusiastic. I was so grateful. 
And we've now had a thousand children who were told they were going to die in prison, get released, and they're out. And when I see them, we hug each other and we cry and we celebrate what doing justice work can sometimes do. We do. But one of the clients who I represented before the court, he had his time for a resentencing. And in this particular case, the judge was pretty hard-hearted. And we made all of the arguments, we said all of the things that we were supposed to say, but notwithstanding all of that, at the end of the hearing, the judge resentenced my client to life imprisonment without parole. It broke my heart. And a few hours later, the young man called me and I started saying to him, I said, I'm just so sorry. And I did something I shouldn't do. I, I, I lost my strength, I lost my composure, and I think I started to cry a little bit. And to my shock and my dismay, it was my client who started to comfort me. He said, Brian, don't worry about this. I know you're going to get me out one day. I don't want you to feel bad. I know this is just part of the struggle. And I felt embarrassed that my client, a 14-year-old who had been sentenced to life without parole, was actually encouraging and comforting me. I said, I'm sorry. He said, no, no, don't worry about it. And for the rest of the day, I just didn't feel very good. And I was going through the day, and finally it came evening. I was going home, and I was just feeling burdened by all of this. And I felt bad by what I had done with my client. And I went into a little restaurant. And there were a group of five black women, older women, sitting at a table. And they recognized me as I walked in. And they waved at me, and I waved back. I didn't pay them any attention. I went over, and I got my little food. And I was about to walk out when one of the women called across the restaurant. She said, hey, come over here. And I looked around and she said, yeah, hey, come over here. And I was a little embarrassed, so I said, all right. And I walked over. And when I got over to this group of women, this one woman said, bend down. And I just stood there. She said, bend down. And so I leaned over. And when I leaned over, she leaned up. And she kissed me on the forehead. And then she said, you keep on keeping on. I... I, I, I just stood there. She said, go home, go home, eat your food. Go home, go home. And when I got in my car, I cried a tear, and then I smiled, and then I realized that I was being challenged to keep on keeping on. If we're going to do truth and justice work, what I'm telling you is that we cannot stop where we are. We cannot stay where we are. We're going to have to do some things. We're going to have to keep on keeping on. There's too much injustice in the world. We've got to keep on keeping on. There's too much inequality. We've got to keep on keeping on. There's too much poverty. We've got to keep on keeping on. There's too much hate. There's too much suffering. There's too much those who are trying to put people down. And that's what I mean when I say that we've got to be willing to do uncomfortable things. That era of truth and justice that Dr. King was preaching about is an era that I believe we have to embrace and hold on to. And so what I want to say to you today is that while it is wonderful to be in this place, when we leave this place, I think we've got to find a way to become part of this movement, this beloved community that is preaching truth and justice. And what I want you to understand, when you hear the words beloved community, it may sound like a place of rest, but the beloved community is not a place of rest. It's a place of action. To be in the beloved community, you've got to be willing to fight the good fight. You've got to be willing to stand when people say sit down. You've got to be willing to speak when people say be quiet. It is a place where we have to do it. I'm going back to Montgomery, Alabama, and I've got Dr. King's words in my ear. I hear him calling us to this commitment to truth and justice. And I cannot be at this pulpit at Ebenezer Baptist Church surrounded by all of these preachers without confessing one more thing to you. And I'm just going to let you know that God's been talking to me. i got to let you know about it. Because I think God's been saying something to me. And what he's been saying to me is that, Brian, I'm worried about what I see in the world. You see, I don't think he's saying to me, I said, Brian, I'm worried. I don't think they believe in grace anymore. I don't think they believe in mercy anymore. And what I hear God saying to me is that I think they're going to put redemption on trial. They're trying to prosecute grace. They've indicted mercy. They don't believe it. And they want a justification and an adjudication that allows them to feel comfortable in a world without grace. And
a world without mercy, a world without redemption. And then what I hear God saying to me is, he said, Brian, I may need an advocate to go to court when they put grace on trial. He said, I may need you to represent us when they put mercy on trial. And I've been thinking about it, but I'm ready if God calls me to answer the call. And I've started thinking about what I'm going to do when they put redemption on trial. And what I want you to know is that I'm going to want the theologians to be ready to testify. Bishop Mercy, I'm going to want the bishops ready. I'm going to want the pastors ready. Pastor Kyle, I'm going to need the elders ready. Dr. King, I'm going to need the teachers ready. I want the church mothers and the deacons. I want the rabbis and the imams all to be ready to give testimony to the power of grace and mercy. But one of the things I've recently decided is that my first witnesses are not going to be the theologians. It's not going to be the pastors. I've decided that my first witnesses are going to be the condemned and the convicted, the faithful who are poor, the faithful who are marginalized, the excluded, the disfavored. And I want you to know, I want you to know, I'm not worried about the verdict. I'm not worried about the verdict. You see, the prophet Micah has already told us what the verdict's going to be. In 6 and 8, he's already said that what God requires of us is that we do justice, that we love mercy, that we walk humbly with him. So I'm not worried about the verdict. What I want, though, is to share it with everybody. I want it to be our victory. And so what I'm calling you to today is to join this struggle, join this movement for truth and justice. And when you do it, know that we're going to be keeping on, keeping on, knowing that we're going to be lifting up truth and justice. And when we do that, we'll open up the doors of the beloved community and all of God's children will have a place for rest, for celebration, and for love. God bless you all.